Okay, let's start then. Good morning. Good morning. As I said during the seminars already, it's a little bit mixed between learning skills and um, introduction to economics. Learning skills is actually business study skills. And there you see already some kind of confusion or possible confusion. Economics is suggested to be identical or very close to business. That can be something to be considered. There's some good reason to say so. But there's as well some good reason to say these are completely different things. And for whatever reason I checked on the internet, I was always suspicious, but I checked on the internet. If you look at the economists, the leading figures in the discipline, what do you find? Actually, few people are trained economists. They are coming from law, they are coming from philosophy, they are coming from maths, they are coming from medical science. I could put a name on each. But only in recent, in more recent times, you find people actually being trained as economists and being leading figures in the discipline. I forgot to mention there are as well um, technicians, engineers, sociologists, and psychologists. Throughout the year, or throughout the semester, hopefully, or already, you will mention how this comes and why it is important. And you will only learn it if you follow what I'm saying, and as I said in the seminars, don't try to do multitasking, don't use the mobile phone, just listen. There are some things you can put into the box, as I said. You have your slides. Ragazzi, could you stop please using the mobile phone? Yeah? Or do it outside. Okay? Thanks. So, I said you can put some things into the boxes of slides, and I do this. But at the same time, be aware of the fact that we are dealing with complex issues that are not always fitting into boxes. One point here is that we actually have different boxes that we can order things in different ways. And I said I'll present myself a little bit, and that's me. That's at least the second half of me, or second part of me. Meaning it's my computer showing which files are there. And in a way you can say this is as well my personality. There are certain things, different things, filed here. Here the yellow part is films, videos. The green part is applications. Others back up audio photos. Now what this all means is a different question. But in a way, there is some hardware that's we, biological beings, that's in our society, structures existing, and that's a computer who puts things into different boxes. And if we look at the boxes, we can only see very little, because it's a pattern we don't really understand, there is no substance to it. 
if we see here audio, we know it is something to listen to, but we do not know, is it music? Let alone that we know what kind of music. We do not know if it's audio books, lectures, the same with videos. It's something we experience during our lifetime. We take up, we make experience, and then we put it somewhere into the brain. Now this is relatively abstract, meaning we don't know immediately what it means. There is no sense to it. This is very much the same. This is when I use my first computer. We had to build these or to, to, to make these punch cards. It's called punch cards. The principle is a very simple one. You won't believe how simple actually these things are. Basically, they consist of two numbers. And the different ways of combining these two numbers, zero and one, only the two, the different ways of combining them gives you a structure. If you put this as software, as, as, as hardware as well, into the machine, into the hardware again, you get something out because the computer knows what to do with it and how to interpret it. And the computer has only one way to interpret it. The computer cannot think, I don't like this result, I, I'll make something else. It was actually a pain working with these things because you had to key these punches, these holes into the card and when there was, if, if there was a tiny mistake, this moving here, the entire job was gone. Meaning you spent half a day to type this, you made one mistake, and everything was gone. You had to start basically from the beginning. Not least because this thing did not tell you immediately at the early stage, this is where you had been wrong. You had to figure out. Today things are very simple, kind of. At least you get a kind of clear structure. I could go or could have gone into details. This is the same picture as the first one, but you here see clear different meanings, applications, it's the same. But documents, you see these are documents. It's not something else, but it's a document. And a document is something like this. Music. I could, as I said, I could have gone in more detail, into more detail, and said documents, word documents, slides, Excel, Whatsoever. I could have another order as well to say this is economics, this is psychology, and so on and so forth. So we are struggling when learning with trying to find out a certain structure that is behind what we see. We see something, we just open the eyes, we hear something, sometimes even we don't want to hear it, or want, don't want to see it, and then we put a structure onto it. And we will come to details there when we talk about economics, there's a tiny difference, small, seemingly small thing. We have economics and economy. 
And the economy is simply what is happening. Economic processes. This is the reality. Like this. This is what we do. Like teaching. Like going to the shop. Going to the shop is an economic activity. It's about the economy. It has huge effects. I don't know how many people are here now, but if you go all at the same time to the canteen, they know people are coming at 11.30 for lunch, and they prepare the lunch for that time. They won't prepare it for 9 o'clock, because they know at 11.30 people are coming. They know, during holidays, there are only very few people here on campus. So they will not store as much as they need. Now, they will only store as much as they need then for a third of the students here who are on the campus. We will try to understand both a little bit. Economics as the theory of dealing with economic processes. How do we understand actually what is going on there? Why are people behaving in shops, in production, in exchange, in defining prices? Why are they doing it? Is it just an intuition? Maybe. Or is there a certain law? Maybe. This is something we have to find out. I don't want to disillusion anybody. But actually I want to encourage you you are studying something that is very difficult. And when you end after this one year, or after the four years, you will know as little as this. It's not much. If you look at the overall knowledge, or at all questions that there are, there's only a tiny thing, a little bit, that you will know. The only reason that I can say it in this way is because I know a little bit more. Just a little bit. Of course, I pretend to know much, much more. It's not really much. If we relate it to the overall knowledge, to the overall reality, we can understand certain parts of reality. But we cannot, or we have huge difficulties, to understand the, the complete reality. Even if you look at the knowledge that is already produced, that you are learning, that I'm teaching. It's a tiny bit of the overall knowledge. There is so much stored. If you go on the computer, on the internet, look for literature, there's one huge problem, actually. You get too much information. And this is important to learn. The information I get, what is valuable of it? What is reliable? And how can I use it? It's not really the knowledge from the books 
that is important. It's not the equations, the formulas, the formulation of somebody, but is the understanding of something that is much wider, that is this reality in which we are living. So we have these different kinds, and then we have this blank part where we actually don't know how can we explain it. And we make progress. When there was a bad harvest, we thought a thousand years ago, there are some spirits and we behaved in a wrong way and now we are punished by these spirits. Today we know it's not spirits, but there are certain laws, certain mechanisms in the reality, in the climate, and we can possibly even change, influence them. One of the problems is, I mentioned a little bit in the seminar, during the seminar, that while, while we are studying, while we are working academically, we're working with relatively abstract models, with theories. And there is one fascination So have a very close look at this video, please. that you thought is remarkable. What we do in academic work, as in life in general, we have this kind of conflict or tension. If you look through the glass, it's exciting enough. You see everything. You actually see more than leaning over the fence. But there is this strange interest, temptation. I want this deep, direct experience. I just want to look not through the glass. I want to experience something myself. Of course, I don't want to jump down there. But at least I want to look what is the reality? Is the glass actually deceiving? I know that it is not. I assume at least that I know it is not. There are a couple of you wearing glasses. I don't know what happens to you if you take them off. 
if you will be able to come without endangering yourself to the canteen. It may be actually that you are more or less blind and you just see some shadows, possibly some, some colors. You may be able to read, you may be able to read only very large letters. So there is a deception. And this is what we always face as a difficulty. We work on theories, we have specific methodologies, and at the same time, we don't know how much do we really gain and how much do we lose. How much do we lose by this wrong perception? If you wear glasses and if you need them, you see something much clearer, but it's due to the glasses, it's not due to your sight. There you come to this interaction between theory, between abstract models, between what we will learn throughout the year, and what the reality is out there. And sometimes we cannot understand, really understand the reality. Can you imagine one billion? Can you imagine? Really imagine one billion? It is actually very difficult to comprehend a number, what a number as such as one billion really means. And then you try to make it perceivable to be able to, to grasp it. One billion is an abstract figure. It's one and billion. One billion and two billion is a small difference. It's just one. The difference of one. One billion another bill, it's two bill. If you look at the real reality, how many banknotes are in it? How many briefcases do I need? This is something completely different. Then you see the actual meaning of what a billion is. And this is whatever we are doing, especially in econ economics, because we are dealing with numbers, we are dealing with figures, we are dealing with, with models. It is exactly this challenge to understand that there is always a reality behind it. Having said model, there is this idea of a model, we make a model of the reality and we, we strive for it. We want the reality to be like our model. We all want to be, not necessarily rich, but we want to have what we need, whatever this is. Of course we want, first thing, be healthy. And first thing, part B, is we want to be happy. And then we relate to others, we relate to our peers, we relate to our society. 
and we relate to the world in which we live, which is much larger than what we see. I don't know if the figures are correct. They probably are not correct because this is relatively old, it's 20 years ago. But it gives you some idea of a summary of the world in terms of looking at something that we can immediately imagine. I don't know even how many inhabitants are on this world, but it's more than one billion. I cannot imagine, right, this is one billion people. I can, can imagine hundred, kind of. I can see them in front of me. And then I arrive at this thing of, with all existent human racial remaining the same, meaning all relationships are the same, all attitudes remain the same. <coughs> it would like the, look like this. 57 Asians, 21 Europeans, 14 from the Western Hemisphere, North and South, and 8 Africans. 51 would be female, 49 would be male. 70 would be non-white, and 30 would be white. 70 would be non-Christian and 30 Christians. 50% of the entire world's wealth would be in the hands of only six people. And all six would be citizens of the United States. 80 would live in substandard housing. 70 would be unable to read. 50 would suffer from malnutrition. And one would be near death. One would be near birth. And only one would have a college education. No one would own a computer. As I said, the figures changed. If you look at the 6%, the 6 wealthiest percent, there are some now in China, actually, in Asia. There are some in Latin America. This doesn't really matter. The changes are kind of marginal. There are small changes. But important is, A, to look at the fundamental overall structure and to try to understand as well try to understand emotionally with your responsibility what it means. I've been once in a museum in Amsterdam it was, possibly you heard about it, Anne Frank house. She was hiding herself, or her family hid her, uh, from the fascists, German fascists. And she was hiding in a small place, and it's kind of pitiful to look at it. And at the end of this exhibition, There had been different things, notes made by visitors. And one said, this is just one girl. She suffered tremendously, yes. But there had been so many others during this time. They suffered even more, they had been killed. Why do we feel such a pity with this one girl? And his answer was, we would not be able to suffer with all who suffered. We need this personification. We need to be able to understand what it means. And this is something very concrete. This is not looking through the glass, but it is looking directly into the eyes of what is going on. It looks quite different than this. This is an unrelated figure. 
But why I show it, the details are not really int uh, of, of interest here. It's the 10 of the best, the most improved livability so, uh, scores over five years, and then 10 of the worst. So livability means simply, is it nice to live in a place? Do you feel comfortable? There are 10 and 10. The reason why I show it is, of course, if we think about it, it is always, what does it really mean, a livable place? And if you traveled a little bit, possibly you come from a small village here in China, in Hunan, or from another province, and you move into a city like this, Changshan, or you move into a place like Shanghai or Beijing, this is completely different. And you will feel it, and you will have to decide for yourself, I like it. I like it better. I, I prefer to live in the large city. I prefer to live in my village. And this is something we always have to be aware of. What does it really mean when we're talking about these abstractions? And this means we have to look as well exactly at the question that is asked. What does livability mean? What does improvement mean? Is it better health conditions? Is it better transport? And this is not just the physical thing that we face, but there is so much involved. The metro opened two or three months ago, the new line. It's so much easier to travel within Shangshan just by one additional line. Which means the entire social perspective, where can we move, is changing. It's about comfort as well. It's about reachability, livability. And then there is this other th funny thing with the figures. And in a way, I come back to the one billion to understand, to comprehend what one billion really means. That's a little story here. Long, long time ago, and there are different versions of it. And the story goes that King Shiram was a tyrant who oppressed his subjects. One of his subjects, a wise man named Sisa ibn Dahir, invented the game of chess for the king to play, to show him that the king needed all his subjects and should take good care of them. King Shihram was also pleased that he ordered that the game of chess should be preserved in the temples and said that is what the best thing he knew of to train generals in the art of war glory to religion and the world and the foundation of all people, all justice. Then King Shiram asked Sisa ben Dahir what reward he wanted for this great invention. Sisa answered that he didn't want any reward, but the king insisted. Finally Sisa said that he would take this reward. The king should put on one grain of wheat on the first square of the chessboard, two grains of wheat on the second square, four grains on the third square, eight grains on the fourth square, and so on and so on, doubling the number of grains of wheat with each square. In economics we say it's an exponential rate of growth. What do we? thought the king. That's a tiny reward. I would give him, have given him much more. He ordered his slaves to bring out the chessboard and they started putting 
on the wheat. Everything went well for a while. But the king was surprised to see that by the time they got halfway through the chessboard, the 30, 32nd square required more than 4 billion grains of wheat, or about 100,000 kilos of wheat. Now, Caesar didn't seem to so stupid anymore. Even so, King Shiram was willing to pay him. But as the slaves began on the second half of the chessboard, King Shiram gradually realized that he couldn't pay that much wheat. In fact, to finish the chessboard, you would need as much wheat as six times the weight of all living things. I think it's quite amazing as well in terms of thinking, and this is what we always have to, have to do when we talk about these models, it's all about practice. To calculate something, to reach these numbers, extremely high numbers, <coughs> is especially today, quite easy. These things have a capacity of the computers I showed you when we used the punch cards. Even a, a mobile phone, a smartphone, is more or less the same as a computer at that time. A computer at that time was as large as this room. It is a question of practice. And it is the, the, the question of your practice, of your life. I was kind of surprised or emotionally touched or confused, whichever term you want to use, when I walked the last days coming from the East Gate, always go for a shop there in the morning to buy some fruit. So I come back on the campus passing the library, the fountain, the, the square. It's never as busy as this time of the year. You see parents coming. And with a little bit of imagination, you can see what is going on. The excitement, the expectations of your parents, the fear of entering such an institution as a university. And as well, probably, you did it last year, as well, this, what is coming now? You don't know exactly. You have some ideas. But these ideas are different, and they are developing. And this is what you have to face throughout the year. <coughs> Whatever you are doing and you, are, you will do is about working your own way with your expectations, and I mean your personal expectations from the university, from your life, with the expectations of your parents. I know many, if not most of you, would not be here and would not study what you are studying. Maybe you would not study at all. Maybe you would have preferred to study philosophy. you get a little bit from me. Maybe you would have preferred to study engineering. You won't get anything from me in this respect. Or arts. So there are expectations, and there are expectations from the society you live in. I'm now here in China for the second year. I had been here before. If I look at the development of this country, if I look at the development of a city like Shangsha, 
it is simply amazing. It's like the one billion. If you move with it, you don't really mention it. If you come back after five years, you see there's a huge difference. And this is not just the difference between having so many houses, having this population now, and having another figure at another time. It is this, what we are all living through. Coming back to the summary of the world, you find huge mobility today. It's relatively easy to travel. High-speed train, a half an hour the times from here to Guangzhou or something. Getting even faster, getting more confident. It's still not affordable for everybody, but it's more and more affordable for many people. And then you study here, and you study certain ways of thinking. And this is something as well you have to bring into this equation. And I just want to encourage you, on the one hand, read the textbooks, do the exercises, but don't lose this fascination of what is actually going on. I was only four years old when I saw my mother load a washing machine for the very first time in her life. That was a great day for my mother. My mother and father had been saving money for years to be able to buy that machine. And the first day it was going to be used, even grandma was invited to see the machine. <laughs> and grandma was even more excited. Throughout her life she had been heating water with firewood and she had hand washed laundry for seven children and now she was going to watch electricity do that work my mother my mother carefully opened the door and she loaded the laundry into the machine like this and then when she closed the door grandma said no 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 let me let me push the button <laughs> and grandma pushed the button and she said Oh, fantastic, I want to see this, give me a share, give me a share, I want to see it. And she sat down in front of the machine and she watched the entire washing program. <laughs> she was mesmerized. To my grandmother, the washing machine was a miracle. Today, in Sweden and other rich countries, people are using so many so many different machines look the homes are full of machines i can't even name them all you know and and they also when they when they want to travel they use flying machines that can take them to remote destinations and yet in the world there are so many people who still heat the water on fire and they cook their food on fire sometimes they don't even have enough food and they live below the poverty line. There are two billion fellow human beings who live on less than two dollars a day. And the richest people over there, there's one billion people, and they live above what I call the airline. <laughs> because they have spend more than eighty dollars a day, you know, on their consumption. But this is just one, two, three billion people. And obviously there are seven billion people in the world, so there must be one, two, three, four billion people more who live in between the poverty line and the airline. They have electricity. But the question is, how many have washing machines? I've done a scrutiny of market data, and I found that indeed the washing machine has penetrated below the airline, and today there's an additional one billion people up there who live above the wash line. <laughs> and they consume for more than $40 per day. So two billions have access to washing machine, and the remaining five billion, how do they wash? Or to be more precise, how do most of the women in the world wash? Because it remains a hard work for women to wash. They wash like this, by hand. 
It's a hard, time-consuming labor which they have to do for hours every week. And sometimes they also have to bring water from far away to do the laundry at home. Or they have to bring the laundry away to a stream far off. And they want the washing machine. They don't want to spend such a large part of their life doing this hard work with so relatively low productivity. And there's nothing different in their wish than it was from my grandma. Look here, two generations ago in Sweden, picking water from the stream, heating with firewood and washing like that. They want the washing machine in exactly the same way. But when I lecture to environmentally concerned students, they tell me, no, everybody in the world cannot have cars and washing machines. How can we tell this woman that she ain't going to have a washing machine? And then I ask my students, I've asked them over the last two years, I've asked, how many of you doesn't use a car? And some of them proudly raise their hand, you know, and say, I don't use a car. And then I put the really tough question, how many of you hand wash your jeans and your bed sheet? And no one raised their hand. Even the hardcore in the green movement use washing machines. <laughs> So how come something that everyone used and they think others will not stop it? What is special with this? I had to do an analysis about the energy use in the world. Here we are. Look here. You see the seven billion people up there? The air people, the wash people, the bulb people, and the fire people. Uh, one unit like this is an energy unit of fossil fuel, oil, coal, or gas. That's what most of the electricity and the energy in the world is. Huh? And, and it's 12 units used in the entire world. And the richest 1 billion, they use six of them. Half of the energy is used by one-seventh of the world population. And these ones who have washing machine, but not the house full of other machines, they use two. And this group use three, one each. And they just have electricity. And over there, they don't even use one each. Of them. That makes 12 of them. But the main concern for the environmentally interested students, and they are right, is about the future. What are the trends? If we just prolong the trends without any really advanced analysis to 2050, there are two things that can increase the energy use. First, population growth. Second, economic growth. Population growth will mainly occur among the poorest people here because they have high child mortality and they have many children per woman. And that you will get two extra, but that won't change the energy use very much. What will happen is, is economic growth, the best off here in the emerging economies. I call them the New East. They will jump the airline, whoop, they will say, and they will start to use as much as the Old West are doing already. And these people, they want the washing machine. I told you, they'll go there, and they will double their energy use, and we hope that the poor people will get into the electric light, and they will get two-child family, will have a stop in population growth, but the total energy consumption will increase to 22 units. And these 22 units, you know, still the richest people use most of them. So what's needed to be done? Because the risk, the high probability of climate change is real. It's real. Huh? Of course, they must be more energy efficient. They must change behavior to some way. They must also start to produce green energy, much more green energy. But until they have the same energy consumption for person, they shouldn't give advice to others what to do and what to not to do. <laughs> here, we can get, here we can get more green energy all over. This is what we hope may happen. It's a real challenge in the future. But I can assure you that this woman in the favela in Rio, she wants a washing machine. She's very happy about her Minister of Energy that provided electricity to everyone. So happy that she even, even voted for her, you know. And she became Dilma Rousseff, the president-elect of a, one of the biggest democracies in the world, you know, moving from Minister of Energy to president. If you have democracy, people will vote for, vote for washing machines. They love them. Huh? And what's the magic with them? My mother explained the magic with this machine the very, very first day. She said, now Hans, we have loaded the laundry. The machine will make the work. And now we can go to the library. Because this is the magic. You load the laundry. And what do you get out of the machine? You get books <laughs> out of the machines.
children's books, and mother got time to read for me. She loved this. I got the ABC. This is why I started my career as professor, when my mother had time to read for me. And she also got books for herself. She managed to study English and learn that as a foreign language. And she read so many novels, so many different novels here, you know. And, and we, really, we really loved this machine. And what we said, my mother and me, thank you, industrialization. Thank you, steel mill. Thank you, power station. And thank you, chemical processing industry that gave us time to read books. Thank you very much.